and thank you to all of you joining on the webinar today. Um, I'm still getting used to this newfangled format, and um, I'm very sorry that I'm not able to make it uh, in person in DC when you all are here in December. I'm actually traveling and doing a lot of book talks that week in other cities, so, um, so thank you for the opportunity. So um, I want to tell you a little bit, um, before I get into the book, I want to spend a couple minutes telling you about why I wrote it, where it came from. So as Richard noted, in 2013, we launched the Washington Center for Equitable Growth, and our goal was to advance evidence-backed ideas and policies in pursuit of growth that is strong, stable, and broadly shared. And um, we do this through a very unique institutional strategy. We work with scholars from all over the country, um, and we have an open and competitive grant program to encourage them to investigate questions of whether and how inequality affects our economy and our society. So we have spent the past six years working with all these scholars, getting them, um, encouraging them to ask these questions and to understand what inequality means. So we've given away over five, five and a half million dollars to over 200 scholars over the past six years. And you know, we asked this question of them, both because it is um, politically important to understand, especially in this era of rising inequality, what that means for broader economic outcomes along with our, alongside our society more generally. We've been told for many decades that the path to a strong, stable, and broadly shared economy is through lowering taxes at the top, through deregulation, through policies that in many ways exacerbate inequality, but we're told that that's the pathway to actually get us to a better outcome on the other side. And um, part of our question is whether or not that is true. And you know, we're also asking this question at this particular moment in time, because there is a lot of new empirical evidence available from the social sciences and particularly economics because of um, the availability of new data, the advances in computing power, and um, advances in methodology. I mean, when I even think back to many decades ago now when I was a graduate student, and while we could run regressions on our computers in our computing center, um, I actually think the phone that I carry in my pocket these days would run those regressions faster um, than that computer center could. Um, and that gives economists a lot more opportunity to play with big data and to come up with new answers, especially in terms of what heterogeneity or inequality means across different variables. So the book is a summation of what we've learned. And it's what we've learned so far. I'm sure there'll be future iterations. Um, and I'm eager to debate and uh, talk to people who are thinking about these questions about what we're finding. And so that's why I'm so happy to be able to talk to you today. And um, I hope you'll have good questions. And I hope that this is the start of a conversation about what this research and evidence means, and also what new questions we should ask to really understand the role of inequality in our economy. So in terms of a roadmap um, for the next you know, 15 minutes or so of talking that I'll do, uh, I'm gonna show you a few slides, a few visuals that, um, that ground us in our understanding of what inequality is, what it looks like in the United States. And then I'm gonna walk you through what we've been learning from the empirical evidence. And then I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes on what we can do about it. And just to get right to the point, I think the title, which is on the screen um, in front of, I think that the screen, I'm not sure actually if you're looking at me or the screen, um, but, uh, but, but I can see the screen, that the title of the book is How Inequality Constricts Our Economy. And I think that does say it all, that what we see the research evidence showing is that inequality constricts growth through the obstructions, subversions, and distortions that it has on the mechanisms that lead to productivity, stable growth, and um, broadly shared prosperity. And um, alongside this finding from the empirical research, I think what we come to understand is that the institutions that constrain inequality, um, especially at the top, and that act as a counterweight to concentrated economic power, are actually what make markets work. And in the absence of those, um, or in the, um, within a society where many of those institutions have been degraded or, or no longer exist, that has unleashed this concentration of economic resources. It has led to the concentration of social and political power that is making it impossible for markets to work as advertised and to deliver the kind of strong, stable, broadly shared growth that we um, have come to expect. So that is the headline. 
And now let me go through some of the details um, about how we got there. So, um, I, I, Colton, if you could go to the next slide, please. Great. So this first slide that I'm showing you looks at income inequality in the United States over the decades of the 60s and 70s, 1963 to 79. And on the horizontal axis is the income distribution from low income to high income. And on the vertical axis is annual income growth. And what you can see clearly from this figure is that over those decades, the United States was a country that grew together. So the vast majority of people saw their incomes grow at or above the average. That purple horizontal line is the average national income growth over that period, which is essentially a concept akin to gross domestic product. But that average national income growth was about 1.7%. And the vast majority of people, all except for the very, very wealthy, saw their incomes grow at about that average or above, especially if you were lower income. So in 1963, when um, President John F. Kennedy said, a rising tide lifts all boats, that, that really was the picture of what was happening in America and what would be happening in the decades to come. Since then, we've seen a few market changes. So the next few slides I'm going to go through document many of those changes. And I want to emphasize, you can get the slides after my talk, the point is not so much to understand every data point. I really, these slides are to be illustrative of the broad trends. Happy to take questions on them, but, but it's also really to understand the overlying trends. So focus on the, try to focus on the big picture. So in the next slide, um, we can see the first important data point. We don't talk about this enough. That over the period from 63 to 79, average national income growth was 1.7%. Since then, 1980 to 2016, which is the latest data available for this data set, average national income growth has only been 1.3%, growing slower. Next slide. We are also a country that is growing apart. And I want to point out two specific things in this figure. One is that clearly we are growing apart, as I just said. If you look on the right-hand side of high-income people, they are receiving the biggest incomes income growth and everyone else is seeing slower income growth and the income growth is actually slowest for those at the bottom of the income distribution. But the second notable trend here is that the average no longer tells us anything about what the average is experiencing, the average person. So over the period from 1980 to 2016, only those in the top 10th percentile are experiencing their incomes grow as much or more than the average which is dramatically different than that first slide I showed you, where all but the very wealthy experienced um, their incomes growing as much or more than the average. So we are no longer a country that's growing together. And this is what led Gene Sperling, who's an advisor to President Clinton Obama, to say a rising tide slips all boats, but some will go aground. A very different story about what we're learning. The next slide gives a different emphasis on what we're seeing in terms of inequality in our society. This is economic mobility, 1940 to 1984, children um, uh, who were born in those years. What this tells us is that if you were born in 1940, nine out of 10 people grew up to out-earn their parents. But among, among those children born in the early 80s, only half are growing up to out-earn their parents. That is a remarkable shift in a very short period of time in mobility in our economy and our society. And economists have found that two thirds of this drop in absolute upward mobility is attributable to the rising income inequality that I showed you in the previous charts. So even if our economy had grown faster in 1980 than it did, um, that would have only closed about a third of that gap in that decline in upward mobility. The next slide I wanna show you looks at wealth. So as we've seen incomes growing apart, mobility becoming less likely, we're seeing wealth congeal in a smaller and smaller number of households with very fast growth in their wealth, while the bottom half, the bottom half of the wealth distribution has wealth that is now about the same as it was back in 1989. And you can see clearly from that, this chart that that is not the case for those at the top. Top 1% has seen a nearly 300% increase in their wealth since 1989. So this is how that, those, that income inequality is congealing into wealth inequality, which has dramatic implications for our economy, as I'll talk about in a minute. 
And then finally, the next slide shows the rising concentration across firms. So this is an index of market concentration. It shows that it's been rising since 1985. And what we know, what we see every day around us is that we are an economy where across industries, we're seeing rising market concentration. Something that I would be curious to if you hear from you all how this resonates in your own work. But um, this is the last trend that I wanna show you in terms of how we're seeing rising inequality across various aspects of our economy. I wanna turn now to what this means for economic outcomes. So next slide. Um, so I'm gonna lay out these three ways that we see inequality constricting growth. So the first one, so if you can hit the next slide button, please. The first one is um, that inequality obstructs the supply of people and ideas into the economy. This limits opportunity for those not already at the top and this slows productivity growth over time. I can give you a lot of different examples from the research literature. In the book, I focus the first two chapters on this. The first chapter is on the development of human capital, how inequality affects the skills that um, people develop over a lifetime. And the second chapter focuses on, focus on the deployment of those skills. How do people with talent and, and good ideas get into the marketplace and how does the marketplace able to make the most of those? So let me just explain to you one study that I think is indicative, emblematic of what we're learning. And, um, uh, and I focus on this in chapter two. Um, a number of years ago, we funded some research by Raj Chetty and his colleagues, um, and they were looking at work on um, patents, right? Because we know that innovation is what drives um, productivity and growth, right? So it's a very important economic indicator. So where does innovation come from? Who becomes an innovator? How do we get those good ideas into the market? So what they did is they looked at all the people in the, um, that applied for or received a patent and their incomes. And then they connected that data with those individuals' third grade math test scores and that child's parental income and their demographic characteristics. And they did this to see um, what the effect was on sort of innate skills uh, and talent on future uh, receipt of a patent. So what they found first was the sort of common sense finding that children that do really good on those third grade math test scores are much more likely to grow up and uh, apply for and receive a patent. So good at math when you're a little kid, more likely to grow up to become an, a, an inventor. But once they looked at the child's demographic characteristics and their parental income, a very different trend emerges. So they looked just at the children that scored high on that third grade math test, all of whom should have grown up, you know, to disproportionately be more likely to become inventors. What they found was that among those children, those that came from the top end of the, uh, from the wealthiest families, four times as likely as everyone else down the income distribution to grow up and receive a patent. Further, boys more likely to grow up and get a patent than girls, and white children more likely to grow up and get a patent than um, uh, black or Hispanic children. And this is among those high scores. So what that means um, is that our economy has lost innovation. In fact, they title this paper, The Lost Einsteins, to underscore the loss of our, in our economy of that productivity and growth. But here's the thing. It isn't just that our economy has lost some sort of general kind of productivity and innovation. One might think that children that come from lower income backgrounds or who are girls or who are black, they might invent different things. So it's not just that we've lost that innovation. We've lost a diversity of innovation. We've lost goods and services that might appeal to different markets because people from those communities don't have the opportunity to become inventors as they grow up. It's an enormous loss to our economy and to our society. The second way that we see inequality constricting growth, so if you could hit next, thank you, is through the subversions um, that inequality um, leads to in the institutions that manage the market. This makes our political system ineffective and our markets dysfunctional. So I focus one chapter on the, um, the need for public investment in the United States. We're seeing public sector investment fall over time, both at the state and local level and at the um, federal level as a share of GDP. And that of course is connected to the decline in tax revenues and the fact that we've lowered tax rates at the top of the income ladder consistently um, over the past 40 years.
And this means we're not making these investments in early childhood education, in, in um, elementary and secondary and public schools. We're not making uh, the investments that we need to in healthcare and, and um, all sorts of things that could, in infrastructure, they could drive our growth forward. And we're not doing that because of the subversive effect of high wealth concentration on political outcomes. So uh, the, much of this chapter is focused on the political science research that shows how our democracy has become increasingly catering to the those at the very, very top of the income ladder rather than to the public good. And that this too is leading to a lack of investments that are hampering growth. In the next chapter, I focus on market structure and, nope, not, not yet uh, on the slide, thank you. On the next chapter, I focus on the market structure and competition. And here, I, I look at the data and what we know about rising market concentration and what that means for markets themselves. And what we see, of course, is as inequality has risen, as we see more concentration, this is um, uh, actually, researchers have found, part of the reason why we've seen this long-term decline in private sector investment in the United States is because of rising concentration. It's actually led firms to not feel the pressure to invest as much. Um, and so there's a, a number of leading economists who have been developing empirical research on this question and um, quite compelling, which shows how concentration is actually constricting growth. Okay, finally, next slide, the third bullet here, thank you. Um, the third way that we see inequality constricting growth is through the effects on the aggregate macroeconomy. That inequality distorts both consumption and investment. So one way that it distorts investment, I just told you, rising market concentration is associated with the lower um, uh, level of private sector investment that we should see given the, the rate of profit. Um, we're also seeing um, and that, you know, and I think it's, a, it's sort of uh, easy to understand that in an era of rising income inequality, with some people having a lot of money and a lot of people not having this much, that has an effect on overall consumption and what's being bought. So here's one final study I want to tell you about that really connects the dots on those ideas. It's by an economist named Xavier Yarabel, and uh, we funded it a number of years ago, and he wanted to understand the effect of inequality on inflation. What he found is that actually, because of higher inequality, firms are now increasingly catering to those at the very top of the income distribution. They have more money, that's where you can make a lot more money, rather than those at the bottom. So what does that mean? There's more product differentiation. There's more competition um, at the top than there is at the bottom, which actually means he documented a higher rate of inflation, a higher price increase at the bottom end of the, for goods and services at the bottom end of the income distribution than at the top. So you can see how this inequality is then distorting our ability to do macroeconomic policymaking, let alone um, what it means for consumers and uh, the economy more generally. So um, as I went through the book and as we spent the past six years understanding these issues, um, I really came to the conclusion that if we want to address the effects of inequality on our society, if we want to advance evidence-backed ideas and policies in pursuit of growth that is strong, stable, and broadly shared, we need to start with the subversions because we aren't going to be able to deal with the distortions on consumption and investment or have the resources or the wherewithal to address the obstructions unless we start by dealing with these subversive aspects. So that's thinking about how it is that we tax capital, how does it we deal with market structure and competition, monopolies, oligopolies, labor market monopsies. I'm happy to go through all of those in the Q&A. Um, but those are imperative to dealing with as a priority so that we can make the investments that we need to in education and infrastructure and the like and so that we can undo these distortions in the aggregate macroeconomy. But those are very big, um, big asks, big things that we need to do. Uh, revamping how we enforce antitrust or uh, redoing, doing another tax reform. These are things that are gonna, they're, they're quite heavy lips, important as they are. So I wanna end today's talk with something that's actually quite simple, quite easy, and quite low budget um, that we could do. We could change our understanding of what economic progress is so that these other big changes, these bigger structural changes, I think will be easier to accomplish. So in the next slide, 
Uh, next, yeah, there we go. Um, this is a picture of what the data that we get every quarter, although it's annual, but we get quarterly updates on our nation's um, national income growth. Again, as I said early on, this is akin to GDP, gross domestic product. It's the aggregate income earned by all the actors across the economy. So you can see what this looks like year over year in the United States. And if you look in the next slide, this is what it looks like when you disaggregate that data. When you show who across the income distribution receives that national income. So those red bars um, and those orange combined, that's the top 10% of income earners in the United States. So you can see clearly how especially in more recent years, the bulk of national income year after year has been going to those at the very top. It's consistent, it's another way of showing actually the data that I showed at the very beginning of this talk, but showing it within the context of understanding one of our most important metrics of economic success, which is GDP, then again to national income, and what it would look like if we actually changed our measure of GDP to incorporate this disaggregation. So the next slide shows what the monthly um, or the quarterly report looks like from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. You don't need to read all the words, but this is what the government releases every quarter to show us what gross domestic product look like. And you can see it's got that same basic chart. But if you look at the next slide, this is what we want that chart to look like in the future, where you actually see quarter after quarter who's earning those gains from growth to focus our attention on whether or not that growth is not only strong and stable, but is broadly shared. And um, with that, uh, in a couple of words of conclusion, we believe that if we change the way we looked at growth, it would open up a new conversation about economic success. And we think that this is necessary in order to um, have a deeper understanding of the, of, of the implications of inequality and what we need to address it for the sake of our economic growth and um, productivity. So the evidence, we argue, shows that inequality constricts growth through a variety of mechanisms, and that leads to these negative overall aggregate outputs. It also means that we need to spend much more time thinking about the institutions that constrain inequality at the top and act as a counterweight to inequality across the income distribution. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Heather, thank you so much. That was a great tutorial and a really wonderful overview of some of the challenges we're facing. Let, let me ask you um, a, uh, about a topic that you alluded to but uh, didn't go into, and that is the role of automation and the future of work and um, you know, the outsourcing of certain jobs in the United States. So what can you tell us about that as far as creating the conditions for inequality? So um, super, super important. Um, you know, when we think of uh, automation, I think it's important to start from the uh, understanding that this has been a long-term trend, right? We have seen technological change transform our economy for generations. Right? We look back at the Industrial Revolution, also a massive change in our economy. And I start there because it is, at the, um, it is as we have this Industrial Revolution, um, and as we saw um, you know, many of the first movers go and sort of take over these new markets, you actually saw the advent of the kinds of policies that ensured that the market was fair. It was the advent of the policies around market structure and competition, our antitrust, um, enforcement policies were put in place at the tail end of the 19th century, right in, and into the beginning of the 20th century. It's also when we first put in place a national income tax, which of course, in, when it was first passed, um, was deemed unconstitutional. We had to change the constitution, and then 20 years later, it was put into effect. So I think that it's important to understand that history as we're looking at the technological changes today, because we see many of the same things. Many of the challenges that we see in um, what people call the future of work what technological change means for workers have to do with the fact that these industries that are um, the new adopters of technology also often have monopolies or oligopolies as these industries are being created. It's that first mover advantage, right? Once Amazon got in there and you know, created this platform, 
to sell us all the goods and certain goods and even services. We order food sometimes off of it at my house. Um, these are um, they're monopolies, and but they're but they're there because of that first mover advantage, closing off opportunity for the next generation of innovators um, who can't take advantage of that same technological change. I think it's important to think about how we ensure the vibrancy of our economy and that new ideas can bubble up and that we can have innovation and competition even in the face of this technological change. So I think that's, that's one piece of it. Um, the other is really to think about what this means for um, labor markets, um, in particular the, the monopsony question in so many of the industries that we're so concerned about. Um, many workers see a uh, few um, or maybe only one employer um, and that really leads to uh, challenges in terms of ability to bargain over wages or over working conditions. So I think connecting the dots on, so to take one other sort of concluding sentence on this, what, I'm, what I think we need to do as we think about technology is put it into its economic and institutional construct, right? That this is, um, technology doesn't just happen out there uh, without being embedded in how firms are using it, how they're deploying it, who owns the proceeds of it, and um, how it can lead to concentrations. So it's understanding that institutional construct, um, construct, and that's, I think, where we need to focus our policy making. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And, you know, picking up on that idea about consolidation and um, the, the lack of competition in certain sectors, we've certainly seen that in the financial services industry since the Great Recession. And over the past 10 years, I think there's been even more consolidation within the banking community. So related to that, I wanted to pass on Heather a question from Steve Slay, who wonders, you know, what do you think um, the role of institutional investors, particularly pension plans, can be in addressing income inequality? And these plans, uh, you know, are representing, you know, uh, billions and billions of dollars. And could they be mobilized in a more constructive way to create jobs, to stimulate economic development on a regional or local basis? And what's your sense about, um, you know, maybe a political strategy as well to make use of that pool of resources? Well, I mean, I think Steve would probably know a better, have better answers to this question than I would. So um, thanks for the question. It's a great one. Um, you know, one of the things, it's, it is so imperative that we think about how we are deploying investment resources across our economy. And so starting there seems quite critical. You know, one of the stories that we hear in the economy is that um, and I hope, I mean, I can't see the audience, and so um, I, I hope this doesn't lead to any eye roll. So let me, I'll say the sentence and then I'll explain it. Um, but one of the things we tell ourselves is that the private sector always knows best in terms of where to make the most productive investments. And I think one of the things that we're learning from the research and evidence is that the, um, the, that the way that we construct the market economy, the incentives, the institutions, that that also creates um, helps, helps establish where those opportunities can be best found and opportunities not only for profits, but for the kind of growth that is going to benefit our economy year after year, decade after decade. And so I think as we're thinking about those institutional investors who have this enormous power um, because they can help direct capital um, to its most productive uses, thinking about the kinds of investments and in firms that we need to make that can focus our growth for the, the long term. So I am not, um, I know as much of an expert on Steve on where all of these investments are uh, uh, currently, but I think that we do need to make sure that um, as we're thinking about you know, some of the buzzwords that we've heard a lot around social investing or green or the like, that we're making sure that we're taking into account, making sure that workers and their families are benefiting and that we're making those kinds of investments in put that are going to lead to the kinds of productivity gains that are going to keep our economy moving forward year after year. And there can be a tension between the two of those, but um, that is where I would focus that attention. Mm -hmm. okay. I think, the, I mean, the other thing which is connected to this is that making sure that, that, you know, especially the federal government is making the investments they need to make in the basic infrastructure, basic um, research infrastructure and uh, infrastructure more generally 
I think is also a critical piece of making sure that those private sector investments can be best, um, best made and best leveraged so that these two are working together. Great, good. And, and Heather, you know, given that the, you know, we had another uh, debate last night among the candidates for the nominee of the, uh, for the Democratic Party, and there was a lot of conversation about the role of um, the federal government in stimulating economic development, and yet we know there's certainly another school of thought, which is the market is smart, and so let the market allocate resources as it sees you know, most efficiently done. So what does your analysis suggest as far as a more interventionist set of public policies on part of the federal government and state governments as well to address income inequality? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that this is where I, I really have been taken by um, some research that uh, I was reading as I wrote the book by an economist named Thomas Philippon, who has this interesting um, uh, in, a, in a paper that he's written, looking at the share of private sector investment, that looking at private sector investment as a share of um, uh, GDP uh, over, um, I think going back to, I must say 1980, but it could be, it could, it's actually much earlier than 1980. I don't have that, actually, you know what, I might even have to figure right here in front of me so I can look, which is, no, nope, don't have it right here in front of me. Um, and, but what this figure shows is that the level of private sector investment has, um, is, is now lower than it used to be. And he, and he traces this back to where that investment should be given the rate of profit in our economy, given how much um, the corporate sector um, firms are making. You know, what is the level of investment that given prior trends, economists think um, they should be investing? And this is where I think it comes back to, where is there opportunity for those investments that are gonna be productive and the role of inequality in constraining um, the demand for goods and services across the income distribution and um, uh, the lack of enforcement of antitrust provisions that mean that you have these concentrated industry uh, firms that don't have the same incentives to make those investments. So some of this, I think if we, wanted, if we want to have the stimulus but if we want to have an economy that is growing at the level that we want, some of it is, of course, you know, especially in an economic downturn, which we are not in right now, um, we need to be thinking about the role of the federal government in making, you know, big investments, and we can talk about that. But it's also about making sure over the business cycle that the federal government is doing their job to, and, other, and state governments to make sure that those markets are competitive that there are incentives towards making productive investments, which is, I think, what economists are finding right now is that the debt, that the institutional um, uh, uh, the infrastructure around firms, around our markets, is not creating the right incentives. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that given that we're at a very low level of unemployment, um, the, uh, you know, while we still have enormous need across the country for investments in infrastructure, um, uh, I myself am always, you know, the, the, the numbers that we see on roads and bridges, budgets that we've seen across the country, um, you know, over the past decade, these are ongoing needs, and we will certainly need to ramp that up in a future recession, but I think it's also really important to make sure that that, that private capital is being put to its best use. Right. Good, good. So Heather, let me ask a question from Kelly O'Brien, who um, is asking to some extent about the gig economy and the fact that many people have multiple jobs. And so, you know, the unemployment uh, is low uh, statistically, but there's a lot of underemployment, uh, Kelly makes the point. And, um, you know, which, so if you factored that in, probably the unemployment figures would be significantly higher. Um, and particularly thinking about part-time employees who are often victimized by retail companies um, in the manners that contractors once were. And that, I guess, relates also to the question about job classification and who is, a, who is an employee, who's a contractor, which is very relevant in the gig economy. So when you think again about um, both public policy to address income inequality, and you think about the growth of the gig economy, um, how do you sort of match those, those realities and what 
recommendations do you have to, you know, to address those problems? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a big problem for workers and their families. You know, again, I, I think it's, it's really quite remarkable. You know, the United States was a, a leader in creating formal labor markets over a century ago. Um, we uh, instituted a minimum wage. We um, uh, put in place policies like unemployment insurance and um, uh, the social security that provided some retirement security. We had um, hours rules around overtime. And, you know, we've really spent the past half century um, in a lot of the state by state in many ways undermining the, um, the formal labor markets that we worked so hard to establish uh, in our economy. And the gig economy really is that, in, it's that informalization. It's people who don't have that stable full-time job with benefits and you don't have a state sector that is stepping in to make sure that workers have those benefits, um, the capacity to have um, the security of a safe uh, savings vehicle for retirement or pension. Um, and then, of course, in the United States, the big one is, is um, not just a sufficient hours of work, but having access to affordable health care because so many people, good jobs, get there through their employer. So I think that, you know, as we watch this debate, um, especially over the last decade, and many people in the private sector are making the argument that, well, in order to be competitive, we need to um, uh, we need to have more flexibility to be able to use workers differently. A lot of workers want flexibility. Um, they want to, you know, uh, be able to uh, have that second job to make ends meet, or um, they want to be able to go to school, so they need that hourly, that scheduling um, flexibility. Um, they're saying, well, we shouldn't be uh, subject to those old-fashioned rules that we have in the Fair Labor Standards Act that, that um, you know, that, that that, that define a worker in a particular way, um, a worker that is then paying payroll for whom the employer um, and the worker has to pay payroll taxes on, most importantly. And they want them to be these 1099 workers where uh, those benefits uh, and payments to Social Security are included. And I think that we need to make sure, um, you know, we live in one of the richest countries um, the world has ever seen. Um, and we need to make sure that we continue to think about our labor standards as ensuring that there are good jobs all across our economy and that we are not taking steps to uh, informalize our labor markets, but are trying to help employers and workers who want that kind of flexibility. So we could be doing a lot more to help workers with flexible and predictable scheduling in ways that would work for workers and in, uh, as employees as well as um, help make them more productive uh, for firms. Um, that's one way that we could think about the gig economy, that it's like reframing the conversation. So it is, it is about helping people get the schedules that they need without saying that then they aren't workers with, with those full benefits, rights, and protections um, uh, such as they are in the United States. I mean, I think that the other thing is that the more we can do to solve the problem of access to healthcare um, and make sure that that is a right of citizenship in some way, so that that is not employment, the less um, challenging this conversation about gig workers becomes or multiple job holders, because that's such a big expense item. That is not obviously not solving the whole problem um, by any stretch of the imagination, but it is an important element. Um, but I do think making sure that those workers um, are covered by minimum wage laws, covered by overtime protections. And I think what we need to add to that is undertime protections um, uh, and scheduling predictability and flexibility to that basket. Right, right. Let me uh, change subjects here for a moment. And um, Jim Dash asks a question uh, essentially about risk, and that is related to climate change. Mm -hmm. And as a major, you know, likely disruptor to our economic activities. Um, climate change, you know, has the ability to really challenge supply, cha supply chains and, um, you know, require infrastructure investments and really upset a whole, um, you know, uh, much of economic activity in many different industries. So what does your research suggest about dealing with such a large unknown, such as climate change, um, and how might that also exacerbate income inequality problems? It's a great question. You know, one of the things that we've been thinking about here is, um, quite frankly, how, how we don't incorporate 
those risks of climate change into our economic modeling, into the economic forecasting, and into the scoring of government proposals. So, um, you know, we have a 10 year budget window that we look at, which obviously is not taking into account the um, effects of climate change on our economy over uh, the, you know, the further out years to, you know, uh, two, three, four, five, six decades into the future. Um, and the, the cost of actions that we are taking now um, that could exacerbate those economic costs in the future. So it's just not taken into account. Obviously, there are huge economic implications. Um, and of course, the other thing that we know is that, you know, that, the, that, that many of the people who are most at risk of um, uh, uh, damage because of climate, weather-related disasters and the like, tend to, you know, tend to be disproportionately low income. Higher income people, of course, can afford um, to uh, you know, move and, and all the other things. But I, I think that this is the frontier of where we need to push uh, economists is, um, you know, we're seeing climate change happening right now um, in our lifetimes in ways that, uh, where the economic costs are becoming acute and measurable. Um, and, the, and of course, uh, connected to that are big questions around immigration and um, agriculture. And so uh, all of these are, um, I think, the next frontier of where econ economists need to be focusing. Great. Um, Heather, and so related to that, you know, what, what are some economic or policy initiatives that you would suggest um, Congress take a serious look at and state legislatures also um, invest in? Related to the climate. Well, so I think that one thing that they need to do, um, think in, uh, one thing that we need to do is do, economists need to do more to figure out how we account for the environmental risk related to climate change in our budget processes and in economic forecasting. Um, that I think is a big, you know, it's the, these are the things that, I, you know, are somewhat unpredictable. Um, we know that part of what is happening with climate change is it's making the weather more uh, unpredictable, more uh, bigger fluctuations. But we also know that there's a lot of places that are more prone to flooding. This is going to mean that you're going to need more disaster relief, all of those implications. Making sure that we are taking those into account as we're thinking about the, the budget decisions that we are making now. And again, I think that's a way, just like with this disaggregating the GDP, a way of pushing into our um, the, the tools that we use to talk about the economy so that we can have a different conversation. I think that, you know, as we've seen with both inequality and climate change, they aren't evident in the data that we have been using for almost a century to talk about economic success or to talk about how governments make economic decisions. And, you know, the data that we're using, much of which was put in place in the 1930s and early 40s, just didn't, it was a time of less inequality, certainly climate change wasn't on the agenda. You didn't have that, that framework. And yet those are our go-to um, indicators and our go-to means for thinking about the, the budget. Um, and I think that if we could change that, that could really open up a different set of um, um, metrics for policymakers. So again, that's one of the easy things that you could do, essentially easier than solving the problem itself. But then in terms of thinking about other policy initiatives, um, you know, I do think that we should be planning now for a future recession where we, are, where we might want to do uh, an infrastructure package and how we could focus that package on addressing the core needs around both inequality and climate. Um, you know, something that both helped us address some of the care um, challenges in our economy, but also helped us address climate mediation, climate amelioration, um, and thought about infrastructure that way, and all the things that we need to do. Um, I think, too, uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done to think about how we are subsidizing different industries and um, to what extent we are not taking into account the full um, economic cost because of the environmental degradation into those subsidies. That seems like a no brainer um, uh, to me, but is obviously not an easy thing um, in this political climate. But again, that gets to the role of high inequality um, in our political process. So I think that, you know, we have these really important challenges 
facing our economy and our society, but we really are uh, starting to confront them with our hands tied behind our backs because of this concentration of markets and concentration of political influence. Um, and so coming at that, I think will make dealing with some of these other issues uh, uh, more possible, more possible. Right. easier. E easy, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let, let me um, let me ask a question about the stock market. This is from Lisa Smith. So, uh, you know, there's been really unprecedented gains over the past several years, and but it seems that the stock market has little to do with how the general economy is functioning. Although many people feel more secure as their portfolios, if they have investments, uh, do better. So how do you sort of reconcile this, you know, the stock market's um, appreciation with the fact that many people in the country don't have $400 worth of savings in the case of an emergency and that half of the public still doesn't have any investments, unfortunately, at all? Um, so how, how does, you know, how do you make sense of that? And again, what might policymakers do to address that issue? So, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things that we've learned um, over the past couple of years um, in real time, right, economists said there's, there was research that showed this, but no, the policymakers didn't listen. But now we've seen um, since the tax cuts of 2017, that while the purpose of those um, was stated to be to spur the kind of investment that was going to create good jobs and grow our economy, um, that hasn't been the outcome. Uh, certainly at the level at which the scale that we saw those um, tax cuts. Instead, what we've seen is a uh, rising stock market and rising asset values um, uh, in, in equities. And in no small part, of course, that has to do with a lot of the fact that a lot of that tax cut was used um, for stock buybacks, which um, inflate the value of stocks um, without necessarily creating more value for our economy. Um, now, you could make the argument Okay, well, if you increase the value of stocks, then that person who owned the stocks is now richer, so they're going to take that money and they're going to invest it in something. But mm -hmm. we we're waiting for that to happen on that aggregate level. I, I think this is the third time I've mentioned that chart that shows that private sector investment is it's not, it's not jumping up in the way we would expect. And there was a great article in the New York Times over the weekend um, about FedEx, who lobbied hard for these changes and um, has not made those investments, but has been you know, very good at take, doing their part to, to boost the stock market. Um, and so I think that you know, we have to connect the dots. So what, I, what I'm trying to do here is to connect the dots between what's happening in the stock markets and how we're thinking about tax policy, especially at the top of the income distribution. Um, and so the, these policies where we have decided that we think that unconstrained high-end inequality or unconstrained concentration of resources across firms or across households is going to deliver um, the kind of investment broadly shared prosperity. That is not what the empirical evidence around us is showing. So we need to be thinking about policies that constrain inequality at the top through taxing capital, taxing wealth, I think is something that we need to be thinking and talking about. Um, is it a good idea or not? I'm not sure, but we have certainly lower taxes on capital now. Um, uh, and, um, and that is one way to, to fix that. But how we think about market structure and competition, that is a way to think about what's happening to the resources of our society that are being funneled through a stock market that isn't leading to the kinds of broad um, investments and growth that we want to see across our society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. good. Heather, we have uh, just a few more minutes so let me move a little bit uh, more towards solutions. And one of the things I know we've talked about before and the American Sustainable Business Council is very interested in is increasing the opportunities for workers to own a part of the economy through co-ops, through employee stock owned plans. You know, there are a number of initiatives underway. Uh, there's some uh, you know, active legislative work going on in Congress. A number of states have created um, employee ownership centers. So what, um, what could be done to rectify some of the income inequality issues, retirement crisis, succession planning, um, providing a more stable economic future for workers vis-a-vis co-ops and, and ESOPs? What's your sense of that 
I mean, I think these are these are good ideas. They're old ideas. Um, whose uh, I think we could argue whose time has come. Um, I mean, I think that one of my longstanding um, uh, and I know I, it's shared by many. Um, my, one of my longstanding sort of concerns is is making sure that workers um, and I don't have. You already have too many workers who have sort of all their eggs in one basket, right? If you if you think about um, people's retirement security tied up in the equity of a firm, um, you know, how do we make sure that uh, uh, someone has this job, they've got this firm, and that their retirement can be somewhat separate from that, so that you're not they don't have they're not doubling down on their risk. Now, there's no way to you know. Uh, that's one piece of the puzzle. So I just want to sort of note that first because that's the one that kind of I always, the one that kind of gets at me that I, I want to make sure we think about. But, you know, we know from the evidence that um, these are ideas that uh, can deliver greater productivity. Um, they can um, uh, be, you know, successful in the marketplace. Um, and some of what we need to do is to change that, you know, again, the regulation of the market like how is it that the federal government is or is not um, encouraging firms to take these steps? Um, you know, and I think, um, and how is it that they are ensuring that there is, um, you know, that people can find other way, you know, that you can sort of separate out that retirement security from the workers themselves, from the, the, from the firm itself. But I think too, you know, the other idea that has gotten um, some attention lately is, is making sure that, that, um, on top of the shared capitalism ideas, which I think are very well worth pursuing, is um, uh, can we change our culture to put workers on boards? Um, can we have that kind of input in firms across our economy? Um, uh, you know, we've seen other countries do this. They've had more longstanding traditions of doing this. But I think with the renewed attention on how to think about worker representation um, that's been happening, over the past couple of years with a lot of scholars really trying to understand in a world where you have so few people in unions, how do you think about that now? That's an idea that I think is also something that, that we should be putting at the top of our policy agenda. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good, yeah. And I, and I will just note that, you know, in the better run ESOP um, retirement programs in the country require workers to not put all their eggs in one basket. Um, and, you know, there are some unfortunate storied examples of Enron and others where that wasn't the case and people lost their life savings, but um, better managed companies, as you suggest, uh, you know, make sure that that doesn't happen. Well, and that's something you could do through regulation, right? I mean, that's something that you could, you could both encourage firms to do more of that joint ownership, and you could also uh, make sure that you're encouraging, you know, pushing firms towards um, for through better practices. Great, great, yeah, yeah. So let me, um, I think this will probably be our final question here and it's from Hugh Campbell and it's um, an interesting question that states that Al Qaeda's central aim in the terror war was to bleed America to the point of bankruptcy. So in your opinion, is income inequality an enabler to achieving their aim? Especially, especially since many of the one percent stash their wealth abroad. That it's an interesting way of teeing up the question. I mean, I do think that you know, um, if you study inequality um, and you really get into the research, this isn't a short term. It's not a short term issue. It's something that you really you need to understand the long term implications of it. Um, and I think that bankruptcy is an interesting word. Like, what does that mean for a country overall? I mean, what we certainly are seeing is that we are a nation that is starving its government of the resources that it needs to do the things that we as a society have already decided it wants to do, let alone the things that, the additional things that many, uh, that, that uh, many citizens think need to get done, right? We have um, deficits that are at um, incredibly high levels when you don't have a recession and you're not in, um, uh, you know, that kind of economic circumstance and, um, and uh, a politics that has insisted on lowering the contributions from those at the top to the public good through lowering tax rates. And so when you say bankruptcy, that's certainly, that's a word that, that comes to mind. It's not the same thing, but it certainly is a society that is, that is being hampered in its ability to act. Um, you know, and then you compare that with the statistics that we see about how the United States has fallen behind and 
um, many of the international test scores for students, for young people. Um, we've fallen behind in labor force participation for both men and women. Um, you know, there is, uh, there is a real um, sense of urgency, I think, to making sure that we're making these investments now that are going to serve our economy for the next you know, 50 years, and we're not doing that. So, um, you know, where will we be 50 years from now? Will we still be the economic powerhouse that, that we were born into? Um, I think those are really big questions. And I do think that inequality is where we need to be addressing inequality is where we need to be looking for answers. Mm -hmm. And across all the angles, not just, not just income, not just wealth, but looking at mm -hmm. all the different ways inequality plays out because yeah. they're reinforcing. Right. Well, Heather, thank you so much for joining us. I, I appreciate everybody's participation and the questions that folks asked. And just remind you that uh, this has been recorded. So we can, if you send us a note, we can uh, send you the recording. We'll also send out the slides that Heather prepared. And finally, if you're interested in digging into these topics more, you might want to consider attending the American Sustainable Business Council um, Making Capitalism Work for All Summit in a few weeks in DC. We're gonna talk a lot about income inequality, climate, workplace issues, and what uh, businesses and business organizations and think tanks and economists can do collectively. And we'll also spend uh, one day on Capitol Hill on December 11th. So again, Heather, thanks so much. And I uh, really appreciate your time. And I appreciate David, uh, David Mitchell, your colleagues' help in putting this together. Very happy and, to. Uh, yeah, and any, any final thoughts on your part? No, it's, it's a real treat to be able to talk to you. All these were great questions. Um, I wrote them all down. And um, I, I, love, I love hearing them because it, it, they all provide inspiration for where our research needs to go next. So thank you so much um, for your time and, and your attention. So thank you. Okay, great. Good. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.